Greetings and welcome to the introduction to astronomy. In this lecture, we are going to talk about Pluto, as well as the other dwarf planets in the solar system. So this is a relatively new object, at least in terms of definitions, as to a type of planet that had not been classified previously. So let's look a little bit about the definition of a planet. What is a planet? Well, really, it was never formally defined until 2006. Now, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union decided that a planet must do two, three things. First of all, it must orbit the sun. That removes moons from being planets, even if they are larger than some of the planets. And we do have at least one moon that is larger than Mercury. But if it doesn't orbit the sun, it's not a planet. It must be massive enough to pull itself into a spherical or an ellipsoidal shape under gravity. So its gravity must be dominant that it pulls it in to that compact shape. It cannot have an irregular shape. And it must be able to clear its orbit of debris. So things like the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt that we'll look at, would, objects there would not be able to be classified as planets because there is still a lot of debris, lots of material in those in those regions. Now the discover what really necessitated this is that we began discovering a large number of large objects in the Kuiper belt that really necessitated this change. The asteroid belt, there's only one large object. Uh, so it really wasn't as big of a deal there. However, when we started finding more objects, especially those similar in size to Pluto, this started to become a problem. So is Pluto a planet? Well, Pluto does orbit the sun, so it meets the first criteria. It is massive enough to pull itself in a spherical or a ellipsoidal shape. That meets the second criteria. However, it does not meet the criteria to be able to clear its orbit of debris. It orbits in the Kuiper belt, which has lots of other objects, many small, but some that are comparable in size to Pluto. So what was done was to make a new classification of object and that was a dwarf planet and there are now five dwarf planets in the solar system that have been confirmed and we will look at those in turn. So let's look at overview here. What are the dwarf planets? Well, the first dwarf planet was actually discovered in 1801, and that was Ceres. This was the largest object in the asteroid belt and is the only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. When Ceres was discovered in 1801, it was thought it might be a new planet. So it was originally classified as a planet existing between Mars and Jupiter. However, we noted shortly thereafter discovery of other objects in that area, and therefore it re was reclassified to an asteroid and then reclassified again to a dwarf planet. So Ceres has had many classifications over the little over 200 years we have known of it. Pluto was discovered in uh, 1930 and was visited by the New Horizons craft in 2015. Only Ceres and Pluto have been visited by spacecraft. And then we've discovered Haumea in 2004, Eris in 2005, Makemake in 2005. Eris of these is the one that is comparable in size to Pluto. Maybe a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit smaller, about the same, uh, same size though. And it's difficult because we don't have uh, direct measurements of it. We have seen it from Earth, but we have not visited Eris. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. First of all, Ceres. Ceres is the largest object in the asteroid belt and was is only about a thousand kilometers across. It was discovered in 1801 and as I've mentioned it was originally thought to be a new planet. Then it became an asteroid. Now it is a dwarf planet. So it's gone through a number of different changes in its uh, classification over the years. Now we'll look at this in a little bit more detail actually when we talk about the asteroids but it is one of those craft that has been studied one of those objects that has been studied close up by spacecraft and we can see it is heavily cratered although we do see some very bright areas here not ice as we saw on the moons of the outer planets but maybe some kind of salty deposit that is dug up in these impacts. So 
very heavily cratered, very old surface that's been around for a long time. No sign of geological activity. Now, of course, the best known of the dwarf planets is Pluto. And Pluto was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. And he was searching for a planet that was disturbing the, disturbing the orbit of Neptune. Now, what that is, is that there was Neptune didn't seem to be orbiting exactly the way we thought. However, what was what was known was we had used this method to discover Neptune previously because of irregularities in the orbit of Uranus and that led to the discovery of Neptune so it was thought to do the same thing. However, it took an exhaustive study of many regions of the sky to actually find Pluto. When we looked at this from uh, earlier studies from Earth, we get images like this. So here is looking for some companions, stars, uh, companion moons, and we can see several moons there in the image. And of course, some of the best images would be from Hubble Space Telescope, and we can see some lighter and darker terrain. So until about 2015, this was our best image of Pluto. We knew there were some lighter and darker areas, but we really didn't have any idea of the detail. Now in 2015, it was visited by the New Horizons spacecraft. And we found that it had an icy surface like the large moons that was pretty much expected. It had ices of methane nitrogen. So those were things that would be expected in that part of the solar system. What was not expected was that there were some regions with very few craters. So it's an active object because some certain areas have had regions that have been wiped out of craters and the darker areas which are more heavily cratered. So in a way like our moon except in reverse. On the moon the darker areas are the lighter cra lightly cratered ones. On Pluto the dark areas are more heavily cratered. And we saw a variety of different types of terrain on the surface. So we can look at some of those images. Here we see some of those uh, regions and uh, various different type fault lines, very plains, very low lying areas, heavily cratered areas. So it was very interesting surface that we saw and not quite what was expected. We saw signs of some of the things, some of the close up areas, very, very uh, flat. So we can see how nice and smooth some of these regions are and that they have been flooded. And in fact, some of this jumbled material could be leftover material from craters that did not get filled in when the material flowed. So this could have been the higher lying areas that were left behind when some icy material flowed through. Now we also saw that there was a very big variety just in a very short range. Here we have some of this region very, very flat and smooth with some pieces sticking through where lava had flooded here a not much higher region kind of on the edge of this that was left behind. And then we go into this more jumbled region and then we have a more heavily cratered region here. So just in a relatively small region we do see a number of different types of terrain and astronomers uh, even nearly a decade later are still studying the images New Horizons sent back from Pluto to learn more about this distant dwarf planet. Planet. Now one thing we do know is that Pluto does have a very thin atmosphere of nitrogen gas. This can be seen in an image like this one from behind. Actually when New Horizons was leaving Pluto it looked back towards the Sun and could see Pluto's atmosphere in relief. It's primarily nitrogen gas because nitrogen gas freezes out at a very very low temperature and at this point Pluto was still warm enough to have a thin atmosphere. Pluto is currently in an elliptical orbit and moving further away from the sun so that atmosphere will likely freeze out onto the surface for hundreds of years until Pluto comes in closer again. Now Pluto does have a number of moons including the large moon Charon uh, which was discovered in 1978 and looks in many ways a lot like Pluto. We see definitely signs of activity on the, on the surface, some heavily cratered regions, but some cracking on the surface as well, and maybe some flatter areas as well with fewer craters. 
So it's a very interesting uh, image and it is tidally locked to Pluto and Pluto is tidally locked to Charon. Those two are locked together and means they always keep the same side facing each other. So one side of of Charon always faces Pluto, just like our moon does with Earth, but also one side of Pluto points toward Charon. So that means if you're on one part of Pluto, you can see Charon in the sky and it will just sit there. However, if you're on the other side, you never see the moon. It will never rise or set. It is locked in what we'd call a geo for Earth, a geo synchronous orbit. It is locked and will stay in the same point in the sky, much as we do with geosynchronous satellites. There are also other moons that have been discovered. Four smaller moons we can take a quick look at here. Nix and Hydra were known prior to New Horizons leaving Earth. Uh, Styx and Kerberos were actually discovered en route, not by the New Horizons craft, but by imaging from Earth and were, were studied, were studied, not imaged very well because the orbit had already been pretty much set. So we couldn't get close to all of these. And you note that some of them have not less detailed images. Hydra has a much more blurry image than Nix. It just happens to be where they were relative to the spacecraft when it flew by Pluto. Now, these two are the best studied dwarf planets, Ceres and Pluto. However, there are other dwarf planets as well. And that includes Eris, which is comparable in to Pluto in size. It does have a moon, Dysnomia, which helps us to determine its mass from its orbit. And we can see both of those here, here as seen from Earth. But again, as with Pluto, we can't see much from Earth. This is even further away, so it's very difficult to get any kind of imaging of it. In fact, essentially impossible to get any imaging of the surface. We also have Haumea and we can picture that here. Now this is not an image, an image of it. This is actually an artist's conception based on our understanding of Haumea from observations from Earth. We see that it has a couple of moons that we do know. know. It is one of the objects that is not spherical, but is ellipsoidal. So it's in a flattened shape. This is also a stable configuration under gravity for a massive object. And if you recall, that was one of the requirements to be a planet or a dwarf planet was to have enough mass to pull it into one of these shapes. And then there is Make Make. Again, an artist's conception image of what it might look like from around that, that dwarf planet looking back toward this relatively bright star in the sky. A very bright star in the sky, but that is our sun. So with this depth in the solar system, the sun is just an extremely bright star, but it does not stand out the way it does here on Earth. So as of right now, these other three objects have not been studied and are not current plans to be able to go visit them to see. But of course, future missions may change that and may get us a chance to learn more about these dwarf planets. So let's go ahead and finish up with our summary. And what we've looked at is that in 2006, a planet was defined and that meant Pluto was removed from the planet classification and reclassified as a dwarf planet. We now know five of these dwarf planets, two of which have been explored by spacecraft. And the studies of Pluto will help us understanding these other objects in the Kuiper belt. So that concludes this lecture on Pluto and the dwarf planets. We'll be back again next time for another topic in astronomy. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.